The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, theologian Dr. Trevor Hart explores how various arts and our imagination participate in the life of the church. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fizell. Thanks for joining us today. Sure. We'd like to ask about uh, historical Christian art. How has it helped to shape how Christians view doctrine and practice? I think much more than many Christians often suppose um, and realize. Um, Art really has had a central place in the church for many, many centuries. Um, now, clearly, uh, at the time of the Reformation, um, for very good reasons, there were some questions asked about certain ways of using art in church, uh, and those remain important. But art, I think, has always been a way of, in which Christians have interpreted and made sense of the gospel. Um, there are lots of ways in which, as human beings, we make sense of things. We tell stories. Um, but Arts such as painting, uh, music, drama, have all featured very centrally in the ways in which Christians have made sense of, interpreted, um, and represented to themselves fundamental truths of the faith, fundamental stories from scripture. Um, so I think whether we're thinking about what actually goes on in church um, or outside church, um, art has had been a central vehicle for the communication of the gospel. There are so many different forms of art. Often we think of painting as yeah. when we think of art, but yeah. actually art goes every, everywhere from illustrations of uh, stories, uh, ideas, uh, human imagination in so many ways. And don't we have to use our language and our experience, and we're trying to talk about things unseen and things we really don't have a clear picture of, and, and yet we're trying to bring them down to our level. Doesn't that leave room for misinterpretation? Well, of course it does. Um, but then, if we limit ourselves to words, we get misinterpretation yeah, as yes. well. Uh, and I think one of the advantages of art, whether we are thinking of, of painting um, or of music, um, or of course if we bring things up to date a bit, um, film uh, and other more contemporary forms that now would be recognised as among the arts, um, one of the advantages is that art engages us at levels and in ways that words alone can't. Now I say words alone, and I say that advisedly because it does seem to me it's very important to hold together um, the levels at which art operates visually, uh, or through sound, um, or through action, whatever it is, um, engaging our emotions uh, as well as our intellect uh, and our imagination. It's important to hold that together with words. Um, but words alone can only take us so far. Uh, and of course, a lot of uh, the more familiar ways in which we think of um, the Christian gospel, uh, biblical stories being interpreted, limiting to words, can actually end up being rather dry if we're not careful. I think most people know that listening to a sermon uh, or reading a Christian book, it's when uh, the writer or the speaker resorts to story, for example, which is an, an artistic form, um, things actually begin to take off and get more interesting. Now, obviously, there's a place for what we might call clear-cut, uh, reasoned thought, um, and there'll never be uh, a context, I, don't, I think, in which we can let go of that or stop doing it. But that needs to be supplemented. Um, it needs to be brought to life. The ideas are important. Then they need to be uh, clothed in flesh, we might say, um, and made more accessible. But I don't want to suggest for a moment that art is simply a matter of il illustration or making uh, abstract ideas more palatable. It can certainly do that, and I think we should be grateful for the fact that it can. Um, but art can also open up depths of meaning, I think, that words alone can't actually reach. Um, and I think in tandem with words, taken together with words, it can be a very powerful force for putting us in touch with realities that, as you said yourself, actually go beyond the level of our understanding very often. What are some uh, examples of, of uh, the, uh, the depth of uh of art, let's say music, when we bring music to, uh, uh, to church, sometimes the music can affect this mm. in a very negative way or a very positive way. It can, yes. I mean, that's a very complex subject and, and there are people far more expert than I am who understand how it works. I'm, um, but it, it does seem to me fairly clear that sometimes the interplay of the words, um, when we're talking about music that's words set to music, um, and the sound, whether we're actually listening to it, 
or indeed um, when we're participating in it, when we're singing, we're doing something, um, making sound in a certain way, which can complement and I think amplify the meaning of the words um, when it's done well. Um, equally, I think a bad setting of a, of, of a set of words, in whether it's church music or any other sort, actually, for that matter, um, seems to me to be one where the sound, the music, actually doesn't work with the words, the ideas, but in some way against them. And again, that can be very hard to, uh, uh, to pin down and explain, but I think we know when it happens. Somehow it doesn't work. Um, there's no sync between the, uh, the meaning that we're uh, articulating through the words and the meaning that uh, is being articulated in sound. It seems that sometimes in, in, in uh, some of our Western churches today, uh, there seems to be a carryover from rock concerts into mm. the into the uh, church service, and uh, the volume uh, tends to come across that way. And uh, many of, I, in my experience, many elderly people have uh, asked if not the volume could be turned down, and yet they're willing to, if it helps the young people, uh, let's do that. Is it a, a historical uh, a phenomenon for? what is art in contemporary life to, or, or secular life, let's say, to be brought across into the church? And is that usually productive, or should the imagination, ha should the church have its own uh, art that uh, does not reflect just what is around us? In yes. I think, I think there are elements of truth in both sides of, 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 of that. Um, I mean, obviously, for many centuries, um, wider culture was shaped, in any case, by, uh, by, by the church, and much uh, music that was written and performed was yes. church music. The church yeah. was the, the key patron for, for the arts, um, not least music. So someone like Bach was writing um, to order uh, for um, church patrons, Catholic and Protestant. So the division between a secular music and uh, a sacred music really only arises in the, uh, the 17th century. Um, and, and beyond when um, music, among other arts, was forced to, to find business, as it were, outside church uh, because there were more constraints uh, and, on opportunities for it within the church. But I think since then it's usually been the case that um, church music has, to some extent, been willing to draw on wider currents of musicality. Not, though, in an injudicious way, and I, I think that the point of your question is a good one, that uh, one can't simply go out borrowing absolutely anything simply because it, uh, it might attract the young people in. Um, we need to be careful, um, and as I, as I said a moment ago, I think music can work at deep levels which we don't always understand, so that, um, that judiciousness, um, that discernment, needs to be carefully done. But I think um, done well, done carefully, um, all sorts of things can be baptised and brought into the sanctuary uh, and made good use of. And there's a, a long history of that. Many uh, hymn tunes and carol tunes, for example, uh, were borrowed from the wider culture of the day. And, and we forget that. We just, we, we've claimed them for our own in the church yes. and, and uh, that's been, been obscured long since. Uh, so I don't think there's anything wrong in principle with doing it, but I do think it needs to be done very carefully. Um, and music written within the church, for the church, or from a Christian standpoint, we think not so much of music for worship now, but music composed by Christian composers, I think can have a powerful impact on, on the wider culture too. Much of contemporary music today, uh, or what's called, at least in, in the United States, contemporary Christian music, much, much of which was written 40 years ago, yeah. or 50 years ago in some cases, uh, seems to have very catchy tunes, very repetitive tunes, but uh, much of the theology seems to be uh, uh, very weak and yet uh, that seems to be what is most popular and most repeated in many uh, evangelical churches. Yeah. You know, I've always thought that <clears throat> if, if one wanted to start a new theological movement or a new Christian church with peculiar doctrines, uh, the most efficient way by far of populating such a church would be to write songs, popular choruses, hymns, call them what you will, uh, with appropriately theologically orientated words and get people to sing them. Uh, because when people sing things, they very quickly um, begin to believe it. Um, and I think we're far too careless in the way we pick up and sing things in church without really thinking. Um, and I try and make it a habit of my own to always read through a hymn that I'm not familiar with and see whether I actually do want to sing it. Um, now, uh, we don't all need to, be, uh, to have theology degrees and uh, be able to uh, uh, analyse church hymn lyrics in, in, in a precise way, but I think we should be cautious about what we sing. And the flip side of that is I think it's incumbent upon hymn writers, writers of songs, to do a good job 
and to be better informed theologically so that what they write is actually carefully thought through and not simply driven um, by the beat or, or by whatever. As I said a moment ago, the, um, the best uh, church music is a happy uh, synthesis in which words, good words and good music complement one another. Um, but it would be very easy, and I suspect it happens, um, for bad words to arise because uh, the music seems to drive it, um, just as it's possible for good words to be spoiled by bad music. Um, but I think, I think you're quite correct that um, we need to be, again, judicious about what we, we sing um, and uh, uh, not be um, driven too quickly by the currents of, of, of musical fashion or what passes and is popular um, in theological terms. Are there other forms of, uh, of Christian art that, that could bring uh, an enhancement to, uh, to a typical worship service? I think it's a shame um, that in the Protestant churches and in the evangelical tradition, commonly, we're still quite nervous about the use of visual art in church. Um, the Reformation was very careful in uh, the direction of its criticism um, about the use of visual art in church. And actually, the key reformers differed quite markedly uh, on their attitude towards it. Um, Luther was far more forgiving um, about the presence of um, of visual art in church, was quite happy to tolerate it. Um, Calvin was much more nervous and quite um, careful uh, about what he thought was permissible. Um, the key concern, of course, was about idolatry. Um, Calvin's worry was that if you put things in churches, uh, people would tend to treat them in a way which might end up in idolatry. Um, and therefore, it was far better to, to have them removed from churches. Um, he was quite happy with um, art of a certain sort outside the sanctuary not at all happy with art present in the sanctuary. Uh, Luther's attitude was um, much more that, well, idolatry is a matter of the heart. Um, if you take away paintings, they'll simply find something else to latch onto. Um, deal with the idolatry, and then the paintings won't be a problem. Um, now, there are a range of issues about which we need to be very careful, therefore, about using visual art in church. Um, but it does seem to me that um, painting um, and other forms of visual art can be very powerful communicators of the gospel. Um, they can enhance our church buildings uh, in a range of ways which enrich worship uh, and used carefully, used judiciously, um, so that we don't fall foul um, of the things which the reformers quite rightly were worried about. Um, it seems to me um, they could be a massive enhancement um, of our worship in, in a number of ways. Art is a reflection of human imagination and you've done a great deal of work on human imagination in a broader sense and how it uh, is a reflection of faith and practice if, uh, in our walk with Christ. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I got interested in this when I was actually asked to write um, an essay on imagination and the Christian hope. Um, and I started to reflect on it, um, obviously, reading around, thinking quite hard about it. And of course, it, it's very apparent when one thinks about hope um, that imagination is um, bound to be central. I mean, what you're doing when you're hoping is picturing things that aren't yet the case um, and making them very concrete. Um, so hope is one very obvious example of a, of a place in Christian uh, faith, Christian life, where we are employing our imaginations. But there are so many others um, in very down-to-earth terms. If you ask yourself, how, what, what are most Christians doing when they pray? Um, most of us, I suspect, when we pray have a picture in our minds. Perhaps for some it'll be a picture of, of, of God as Father or something. Uh, perhaps for others it'll be, it'll be Jesus. Um, now, it's very hard to, to pray and to pray to uh, uh, a person without picturing them in some way. Um, so again, that's another context in which, for, for the life of faith, imagination really is quite indispensable. But then I got around to thinking, well, how about Jesus himself? I mean, Jesus' teaching strategies, weren't they highly imaginative? Um, so that in, in, in breaking open, again, quite complex um, and difficult ideas, the kingdom of God, um, whatever it might be, Jesus tends to bring things immediately into the sphere of the imaginative and say, well, look, it's a bit like this, and then would tell a story, or compare uh, something abstract to something concrete so that could, people could get a handle on it quite quickly. Um, and it began to become apparent to me that actually in all sorts of ways, in almost any area of Christian life uh, and faith, um, the imagination crops up very soon um, and seems to have a very central function to play. I actually think one could describe Christian faith itself as uh, a way of imagining the world. 
Now, people get nervous about that because the word imagination tends to be lumped together very quickly with another word, imaginary. Um, and I think the automatic association between the two isn't helpful. Um, there's nothing wrong with things that are imaginary, um, but not everything that we imagine is imaginary. Lots of things that we have to imagine because we have no other way of picturing them um, are all too real. Um, and faith, of course, is uh, when one comes to faith, one thing that happens is a completely different way of seeing and feeling and tasting the world um, slides into view. And if that's not uh, a matter of the imaginative, I don't know what is. It's a way of picturing reality, picturing the world, picturing our relation to God in a completely new way, as if someone has changed the backdrop um, against which we're, we're situated. Um, so again, uh, a very fundamental way, actually, in which to be imaginative as human beings seems to be basic to what we are, uh, and in the life of faith, that has an absolutely uh, basic role to play. Now, is that something that uh, many Christians are will shy away from the idea of, do, of it, yep. and yet everybody does it. You can't sure. be alive without uh, having some uh, goings-on in your brain that, that put together ideas right. and bring something out, and that is imagination. Yeah. Can Christians go too far? Is there something they should be worried about or careful oh, sure. about? Well, uh, you're right. I mean, I, think, I, I like to think of the imagination as whatever's going on in the mind's eye, as we might call it, and that can be good and healthy, <laughs> and it can be bad and unhealthy. Um, and I think it's perfectly reasonable that, that Christians might be concerned about certain things the imagination is capable of. Um, and actually, one of, the, one of the things I'm always slightly cautious about is that in, in the 19th century in particular, um, there was a rediscovery of the imagination um, and a tendency to associate it rather too quickly, uh, almost automatically, um, with things of God, um, with the divine spirit, and so on. Um, so one of the things I like to do with my students is point out to them that the imagination can be enormously dangerous. Um, and what I usually say to them is there's nothing more imaginative than a torture chamber. Um, one very concrete example of how uh, we can use our imaginations to devise things uh, which far from being good and healthy uh, and the things of God are actually um, manifestations of evil. And that tends to be the, 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 the thing I think which underlies a lot of Christian concern about the imagination is it can be the maker of all sorts of things which are dangerous and damaging. Um, Okay, it can, but it also lies behind most of the things which are good uh, and life-giving um, and healthy. So, for example, um, knowing how to deal with somebody who is in um, a difficult place, an act of love, we might say, or mercy or charity, call it what you will, um, is a highly imaginative thing. Um, knowing how to relate to another person effectively and well in any context is an imaginative activity. Um, and I think that what we need to realise is that the imaginative is a fundamental disposition of what we are as human beings. And like most of the other things that we are as human beings, can be used for good or ill. Can be a tool in the hands of God's spirit, um, or can actually be uh, a device we use to with withstand God's spirit um, and struggle against it. Um, so I don't want to automatically, uh, as it were, baptise the, the imagination and say everything that's born of the imagination is necessarily good and healthy. Um, but I do want to recapture it, um, to reclaim it actually for the kingdom of God and say, you know, God made us as imaginative beings. Um, we can't remember, we can't think where we've come from without exercising our imaginations. We can't anticipate or hope for what lies in the future without using our imaginations. We can have no sense of who we are, where we're going, where we've come from, um, or what we should do and who we should seek to be. Um, so the imagination really is um, a place in our lives where if God's spirit lays hold of it um, and uh, renews and redeems it, can be a, re a remarkable resource uh, for good. One of the ways I sum that up often is to say, um, as Christians we talk about God's spirit being present in us and transforming us from within. We're not so good at, point at trying to identify the places where that happens. I have a hunch that if we talk about the imagination in that broad brush sense of, our mind's eye, the way we envisage things, the way we see ourselves, the way we see the world, um, then the imagination could be one place, if not perhaps the main place where God's spirit, present and active, uh, works in renewing us um, and conforming us to Christ. Well, really, our imagination is all we have, isn't it, as far as uh, any kind of planning, ideas, uh, coming up with uh, what to do next. We're, we're continually... Uh, Yep. Anytime, anytime we actually move beyond, in our mind's eye, where we are now, then we're being imaginative. Um, whether, as I say, we're thinking about what happened yesterday, um, or what we might be having for dinner tonight, um, that's imaginative. 
Um, if we're thinking uh, of planning um, a service for the weekend, um, that's imaginative. If we're expecting uh, something to happen in life, um, that's, I mean, almost anything you can think of that gets us outside of the immediacy of the here and now, this moment, um, involves the imagination to some extent uh, and in some way. As Christians, we're participating in the life of Christ. And as we read Scripture, of course, that is a part of that process as uh, Scripture becomes the witness yeah. of who Christ is with us and for us. And uh, how does imagination play into yeah. that? Well, the first thing I'd say is if, if as Christians, we sit down and look at the content of what God has given us as a book through which he makes himself known to us, just how much of it is actually imaginative, highly imaginative, the sort of thing that any literary critic would say, oh, that's an imaginative genre. Yeah. Um, so story, poetry, parable, um, and so on and so forth. History, I mean, history which figures God in it is, is a way of patterning things, tracing a pattern through a series of events over centuries. Um, all of that is highly imaginative in terms of the, the actual content of Old and New Testaments and the pattern um, in which we trace through them a story um, leading from creation to, uh, to the last things. But it's not just the content of Scripture that's highly imaginative in that technical sense. I think the ways in which as Christians we read the text, make sense of it for ourselves, find ourselves as well as God in its pages as it were, here, God speaking to us through its pages. All that demands huge acts of imagination. It's not a way in which people ordinarily um, would see or think of themselves, um, but we're called to do it. Uh, God gives us these texts, calls us to read them together, um, and to seek his voice. Um, again, seeking and finding are highly imaginative activities. So again, this idea that actually um, the imagination is a living and vibrant thing through which we come to see ourselves differently, and of course, therefore, to live differently, um, seems to me to be fundamental to the ways in which we engage with the text of Scripture um, as God's Word in the church. Uh, aren't there some um, uh, principles, let's say, or guidelines that uh, Christians can bring to uh, keeping their imaginations within some sort of reasonable boundaries when they come to the Scriptures? Because often, as we read the Scriptures and bring our experiences to them, uh, we can begin to... Uh, abuse other people and our, and our uh, as we interpret the scripture, assuming that our view is God's view. Yeah. And uh, how, how can a person not let their uh, imagination lead them astray as yeah. they come to the scriptures? Well, I mean, you're quite right, of course. We can do all sorts of things with the text of the Bible if we wish to. Um, we can misuse it as well as use it well. Um, and so putting that back in terms of the uh, the question, there can be good imagining and bad imagining in, in relation to Scripture. I think we have to be guided by what we find in the text itself. Uh, it's not a free-for-all. We can't just do what we like with the text. Um, so we have to be guided by the patterns that we find in the text and work with those. But I don't think Christians have ever thought that um, being faithful to the text of Scripture was simply a matter of um, reiterating the text. The best uh, practitioners of Christian faith, as it were, and the best theologians have been those who've identified the patterns within the text and then extrapolated them uh, in a way that's faithful to the text, but applies it to new situations, um, answers questions which the text itself uh, perhaps doesn't answer directly, um, but to which it's relevant. Um, almost in the way that one might think of uh, a, a jazz pianist or saxophonist um, uh, improvising on a theme or on themes that are there within the piece, um, but now there's something uh, new and imaginative to be done on the basis of it for a, for a new context, a new situation. Um, so yes, uh, it's possible to use the imagination badly in relation to scripture, just as it's possible to use it badly in relation to almost anything else in life. Um, we're fallen in our imaginations just as we're fallen in our minds and in our wills. Uh, and in our bodies, but all the more reason then to suppose that we're also redeemed in Christ in our imaginations as well as our minds and our wills and our bodies. Um, and the other thing to say, of course, when we're talking about Scripture is uh, we should do it prayerfully. <laughs> is there something to be said for doing it in the context of the body of Christ as opposed to just on our own as we bring? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yes, I, I mean, I, I do think, and this is to some extent something that Protestants and Evangelicals not least perhaps need to rediscover. Um, the importance of the church for the reading of scripture. Um, that it's not primarily an individual exercise, it is primarily an exercise within the body in which we have to listen to others, learn from others, as well as offer our own voice um, and expect to meet Christ as we meet others and engage with them um, and not in isolation. Now that's not to say that God doesn't speak to people that we can't meet Christ in the uh, 
uh, in the privacy, as it were, of our, of our own uh, space. Um, but I think the more normal expectation is that that will happen as we engage with other Christians in faith, in the community of faith, and share our interpretations. Um, voice the things that we think we discover in the text and see whether those are resonated uh, by what others find there and see whether they're confirmed uh, or called into question by what others find. I've seen a bumper sticker uh, on a number of cars that says uh, something like, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And uh, it, you know that they're talking about specific social issues that, about which they have reached a conclusion uh, that, uh, in which they're condemning those who do it. And, yeah. uh, it, and it's uh, uh, their way of using the Bible as a tool yeah. uh, to get across their agenda. Yeah. Yeah. I think we need to be very cautious about that. Um, it's, it's always complex asking questions about issues to which the Bible itself sometimes appears to give no clear answer, um, but which it will be very easy by using it in certain ways to, to make it seem to speak. And again, I think the, the secret to that is to approach the text prayerfully, to seek to be as aware as we can of our own failings, um, of our own tendencies to make it say what we want to find in it. Um, but again, to situate our reading of it in, uh, in, in the community, to, to air our readings, uh, to hear the readings of others, and to seek truth together prayerfully. And, um, because at the end of the day, what we're concerned with is not faithfulness to our own readings or even those of our tradition, um, but faithfulness to what we hear God speaking in, in the text as we read it together. Uh, speaking of imagination, the fact mm. that we have it and, and the fact that we, uh, that Christ is one of us and uh, therefore uh, shares imagination as, as well, but it, it, in more than that, if we're made in the image of God, then that we have to think that God has imagination which transcends our imagination and is the uh, source and being mm. of our imagination. Um, well, how would we think about God and imagination? Is that a fair question. Well, it's a huge question. Um, there have been theologians um, who have wanted to use the term imagination fairly directly of God. Uh, obviously, any term we use in speaking of God, we're, uh, we're using very carefully because, uh, as Christians have long recognized, God is not like us. Um, you know, as God says in Isaiah, my ways are not, not as your ways. And that otherness is really very important. However, uh, the Bible doesn't hesitate to use uh, human terms of God, uh, thinking, speaking, acting, um, and so on. And it seems to me that imagining is a perfectly reasonable one to use. Um, and to think of God, in some sense, on the analogy of, of, of human imagination and his dealings with things can help us to, um, to uh, get a grip, perhaps, on uh, the ways in which God deals with things sometimes. Um, but we do need to handle the terms very carefully. Um, we can't simply project the, all the features of human imagining onto the clouds and assume that they're true in some amplified sense of God. That would be a very dangerous way to go. Um, but I wouldn't resist the term imagination um, just because um, it's one that we don't find on the pages of the Bible uh, all over the place. Um, it seems to me that the Bible does show God acting imaginatively, creatively, uh, if you prefer the term. Uh, in response to all sorts of situations, um, so that it seems to be reasonable to use it in that way. Well, even the term imagination has to do with image. Yeah, it does. Uh, a created image you know, yeah. of which we are. Yeah. And Christians have sometimes um, wanted to, to use the image of the artist, coming back to artistic imagination, um, as a particular way of picturing God's creative relation to the world. Um, again, I think there are some ways in which we need to be careful about that, but it seems to me as a picture to, um, to work reasonably well in certain respects. I mean, the idea of God taking care over something, um, pouring a gratuitous amount of effort into the making of it, um, and the standing back and looking at it. The uses the uh, potter and the wheel Indeed, as the yeah, image of God. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that sense of aesthetic judgment that we get in, uh, uh, in Genesis 1, where you know, God stands back and sees that it's good. I mean, I, I think all those things do speak... Uh, very much to uh, the human experience of, of making something, doing it well, doing it as well as you can, and being pleased, satisfied with, uh, with the outcome. Um, and of course, caring for what you've made, uh, having placing great value on it. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.